I'm thinking about I'm thinking about Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and that song the next episode and at the very end it's like smoke weed every day you know that song right and then oh, of, course. of course right that and was so, an anthem yeah and so thinking about it it's like I mean these guys do smoke weed every day I mean Snoop Dogg all day every day and yet extremely professional or, or extremely um successful multi-million dollar music producer musician and yet I know other people smoke weed every day and they barely get up off the couch. So let's talk a little bit about the genetic differences in um, that, that lead to different sort of effects of cannabis in people and how that those genetic differences, as you suggest, is, is almost is as important, if not more important to understand than the actual pro, like cannabinoid profile of the plant. But before going there, maybe just give us like a quick crash course in the endocannabinoid system uh, so that we understand what we're talking about when you're bringing up, bringing on this, these exogenous cannabinoids. Yeah, sure. So your body has um, Im embedded within it in almost every single cell uh, endocannabinoid receptors that are sensitive to these chemicals that are shaped very similarly to THC or CBD, these cannabinoids um, that get produced in the cannabis plant. And when you look at the um, you know, human evolution from a um, you know, historical perspective, it's because at some point we had a common ancestor that uh, we shared these types of receptors with, with plants. Um, and you know, we use them for vastly different functions in a you know, human system versus a plant system, but that shape was conserved over time. Um, and so we produce naturally our own endocannabinoids and endo meaning, um, you know, interior produced by your own body versus exogenous cannabinoids, which would be something like, you know, smoke THC, uh, CBD. And the main two ones we produce are these ones called anandamide and 2AE. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce the very long name that that stands for. Um, but these, uh, these chemicals get produced by our body and they they serve a regulatory function. Um, and, uh, it's very, it's a very ubiquitous system in the body. They, they've really realized that when I say every cell in the body has these on them, it, 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 it's, you know, super just an underlying system that can mm -hmm. modulate all these other systems in the body, which is why you see people claiming that, you know, CBD has helped them with every single thing, uh, under the sun is because for some people it shifts function in the right direction in all these different systems. Um, and for other people, not so much, but the, uh, you know, it serves a regulatory function with the immune system, um, in terms of memory and stress resiliency, especially, uh, feeding, uh, there's some, re and, and hunger, you know, obviously the munchies are, are very real phenomenon and, mm -hmm. uh, they've, they've shown that people with uh, higher or lower levels of their own endocannabinoids tend to have different appetite, um, kind of profiles, uh, more or less hungry just in general. Um, and you have two main endocannabinoid receptors, um, these ones called cannabinoid one receptors and cannabinoid two receptors. Uh, the cannabinoid one receptors are going to be more in the brain, central nervous system. Uh, those are the, what THC will activate, um, responsible for the high feeling, uh, cannabinoid two receptors are going to be more in the peripheral organs of the body and the immune system. And, um, that's what the two AE cannabinoid activates. Um, so that's less about, you know, a, um, a specific feeling of being high, but more about managing inflammation or um, shifting immune system function. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, when I started looking at the research that was out there on the genetics of this stuff, um, I kind of had to sort through it in a way to interpret studies that were being done almost exclusively from an addiction and problematic behavior standpoint, because that's where the research money was. Um, yeah. Proving and, that cannabis was bad. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least giving at least like framing it in a way where this is, you know, problematic drug behavior. Right. So there, there was absolutely no, like in the discussion at the end of the, of a academic, you know, article, um, 
you know, there, there's no discussion of, well, how could you use this to give people information about how they could have a better high or how they could learn how to, um, you know, use cannabis in a more effective way. And, and so that's what I was kind of doing is, is looking at these from a different perspective, saying like, all right, what would actually be useful here for like the average, you know, cannabis user or someone interested in it, maybe that has never even tried it. But now that it's more available uh, what could they glean from this information about themselves and what you're saying about Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre smoking all the time and, you know, maintaining high function. There's some really awesome stuff that, um, the, there's some really robust stuff around, uh, cognitive function and cannabis. Um, and like you're saying that, you know, strains make a, and terpene and cannabinoid content make a difference. But I, I think uh, on a baseline level, uh, some of these genetic factors really kind of supersede that for some people. So, uh, you know, to give you an example, there's a, there's a gene called COMT. Um, it's a really well studied gene. It's an enzyme that, that breaks down dopamine in the brain. And so some people with higher levels of this enzyme have lower levels of dopamine and, and vice versa. Um, and you and when you look at like personality studies on this stuff, there's really high correlations with all kinds of different measures of, uh, of, you know, something that, um, I mean, dopamine's a pretty basic, it yeah. shows up in a lot of places. Right. Yeah. So, uh, it, it turns out that when they studied, um, this with cannabis, it really impacts your short term memory. And between the variant that produces high amounts of COMT and has lower amounts of dopamine in the brain and the variant that uh, tends to produce lower amounts of COMT and has higher dopamine in the brain, they found about a 35% difference in working memory efficiency after mm -hmm. smoking. Uh, so, you know, doing um, different types of um, testing inventories of like making people remember, remember numbers and hold things in their head and trying to like, uh, you know, do little memory puzzles and that type of thing. So like um, people with high dopamine, what, what, what was the correlation there? So high dopamine is greater working memory, low dopamine, less working memory uh, as yeah. a predisposition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and this is really talking about what they call tonic dopamine levels uh, versus phasic. So, so tonic is sort of like your baseline levels that are kind of in your brain uh, before you get a dopamine spike. Like if you, you know, have sex or take a hit of a joint or, or do something pleasurable, you'll get that kind of Real spike. Real fat line of Adderall and that kind of right. thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm the, kidding. The, Come on, guys. The, 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 typic, <laughs> the typical ways we, we boost dopamine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 so yeah, this is talking about kind of baseline levels, but it, it really heavily impacts, uh, your working memory, uh, with acute cannabis consumption. Um, and, you, and then there's all these other things that, you know, that, that'd be kind of like the main one. Mm -hmm. And then there's all these other ones they studied that seems to have, you know, a, a little bit less of an overall impact, but, you know, maybe adds a, each one of those things adds maybe a two to 5% kind of difference. Um, so what I've done is I've taken these and created a, a test or, you know, kind of profile that I run with people and I'll see people sometimes that have every single protective variant in the cognitive function domain like like they have all of the genes that are associated with uh less impulsivity or less um error making and better working memory and uh that would probably be your dr dre's and your snoop dogs and then sometimes i'll i'll run this with people and i'll see um you know the exact opposite where they're the um the low dopamine COMT variant and they kind of have everything else that's going to keep pushing in them in that direction. And so when you think about how you might, um, you know, kind of create an overall assessment, right? Like it, it, you kind of use this, what they call a polygenic score. So you're, you're sort of stacking these factors up together and you know that some are going to be more impactful. Some are going to add just a little bit of a, you know, push one way or another. Um, and then you do the same thing with nutritional genomics where, um, you know, maybe there's 20 different genes that are going to impact uh, saturated fat metabolism. And there's like two that are really, really important. Like if you have this certain variant, like that's going to trump everything else. You really don't want to do saturated fat. Don't want to do the Dave Asprey approach. Mm -hmm. um, but you really kind of got to take into account all these things work together in a complex system. Um, and so with the, the cognitive function thing, like, 
you re- I, I've just been see- I've been amazed at how well it's been correlating to people's experience and what they describe. Um, and I know for me that you know I, I I was an everyday weed smoker starting when I was about fourteen, and when I stopped when I was about twenty five, um, because I was you know I'm kind of realizing oh I've been repressing all this emotional stuff by avoiding you know avoiding all the real work by just getting high all the time mm-hmm. um my coincidentally like my cognitive function and my ability to in, to sponge up information and think just like got so much better and uh looking at my genes you know it makes a lot of sense I'm I'm kind of, I'm one of the COMT variants that's actually in the middle between the two um, halves, but I have a lot of the ones that are associated with, uh, less sustained attention and, um, generally less positive kind of results. And, uh, you know, for certain people, like I, I have, um, I had one client who was a, you know, cannabis entrepreneur and they were super functional and sure enough, and their, their genes reflected it. So I think there's a, um, you know, it's just helpful to kind of understand this stuff on a more objective level to sort of inform some of the um, ways that our brain hides ourself from ourself. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't realize that I wasn't performing at a high enough level or as, a, as you know, or wasn't, you know, being able to think as well as I could have while I was high all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe if someone had told me this, I would change things. Probably not, but at least you know, if you're, if you're wondering, you know, is cannabis something that I should like, you know, kind of moderate when I'm trying to do, you know, serious work or, uh, what's the appropriate way to use it. I think the, this type of information is really helpful. Yeah, I would, I would think so too. In fact, you know, doing the research on your work, um, in, pre- in preparation for this, I pretty much immediately, you know, within, you know, an hour of looking into things, started logging on to 23andMe and being like, okay, how much does this cost? When can I get this done? All right. How do I figure out what, where's the, where's the library of, of, uh, of reference material for me to figure out whether or not I should be smoking cannabis every day or not? I mean, it seems all right on some levels, but maybe on other levels, kind of like Matthew Walker, um, scientist on sleep says about sleep deprivation that uh, people, the less sleep they get, they, they, you know, statistically do worse and worse and worse on tasks and yet continue to believe they're actually doing better, even though they are objectively doing worse. And so I think I'm doing better, you know, but, but am I actually doing worse, you know? 